Ania Story and Mike, thanks so much for joining us. And, you know, players and athletes have been out in the community trying to find solutions to problems for a while, which is why we assembled this panel. And um, no slight to you, Tori and Mike, but I'm going to kick this off with the Hall of Famer, <laughs> Aeneas Williams. And Aeneas, you're going to be part of an NFL town hall with a lot of legends and players to kind of discuss some of the initiatives that athletes in the NFL are going to try to take to address some of these issues. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, one, when it comes down to legends, which would for the audience, so they don't know any former player that's played at least a year considered a legend. But being on this panel tomorrow, it's really to get legends together, current athletes together, along with the league to create a discussion. Because one of the things the National Football League does very well, and it is uh, best practices shared among all 32 teams. So a lot of times, a lot of what athletes want to do uh, as an athlete, as a Hall of Famer and an NFL player, and Tour will tell you this, our notoriety is a key that gets us in the door. But now what we would like to do to have discussions like tomorrow where we can create dialogue and come up with what are some of the practical ways that we can influence community once we use the key of our fame and notoriety to get into the door. And, Tori, to that point, you know, the legends, the, the players, you know, their voices, their notoriety. You have been out, along with Aeneas and so many other players as foot soldiers, for so long. What we're seeing now, though, in the streets, after the George Floyd death under the knee of that police officer in Minneapolis, does it feel different to you? Does it, does it seem different to you from maybe some of the efforts that you've been trying to work on for years? It actually does, and you know, I was actually having a great conversation with Aaron Maven about this. It feels different, and this time I'm actually more hopeful because people who may not have been listening or even understood what people were trying to say before, that you have their ear, and now they, it's like they all of a sudden become awake and aware of what's been going on and what people have been complaining about for so long. So it does feel different, and understanding that is more important for us now than ever to be involved together, to go out, acknowledge some of the wrongs that exist, and go out there and fix it. Well, well Mike, as a member of the media, we can go back four years ago, and Aeneas and, and Tori, you know, if you want to chime in on this as well, when Colin Kaepernick did not stand for the national anthem, was trying to bring attention to this, and Tori, when you were trying to bring attention to this, the narrative was more so about the protest as to why there was a protest. And Mike, why do you think that's changed? Because it does seem now more and more people, as Tori were, was just saying, are, are discussing kind of the underlying cause. Well, we're living in a surreal time. And uh, not only are we, of course, uh, socially distancing and a captive audience as, you know, the horror of George Floyd and, and other videotaped atrocities played out, but for the first time in my lifetime and, and a lot longer, we have open racism at the highest levels of our government and egging on others to do the same. And so uh, Tori is absolutely right. We're noticing more and we can't help but notice because when you combine racist rhetoric with, uh, you know, the realities that continue to play out uh, and a captive audience is finally, you know, forced to do nothing but watch that uh, while we're all sitting at home. It has woken a lot of people up. And I, and I want to include myself, because as much as I've been advocating as a media member for racial equality and, and fighting against what I perceive as injustice, you know, we all need to listen more and we all need to do more, I think. And it's just, uh, you know, if you were trying to play the middle before, and say, well, yeah, okay, I, I, I understand that they're upset, but I don't think he should be doing that. Like, it, you know, it's disrespecting the military. That doesn't work anymore. If, if you want to uh, exist among black Americans and other Americans who've been systematically subjugated for a long, long time, you better be listening and you better be understanding and you better choose the right side of this because if not, you might as well be on the openly racist side. 
going back to even when Kaepernick first took a knee, I mean, we saw him explain his message perfectly, in my opinion. Everything they said back then is the exact same thing that people are talking about right now. Literally no different word for word. You want to talk about police training and the lack of training that which people are learning about in the short term, the short amount of time it takes for a person to earn a gun and a badge. That's something that he brought to light way back. And it's important to acknowledge that. But even talking about the protesting and the flag, which was very divisive for a lot of people, and it honestly allowed them to distract themselves from the real message, that's no longer the case. You know, like Mike said, you can't hide behind that rhetoric anymore. And we know soldiers like my father who fought for this country, and they can tell you firsthand, they've even experienced, you know, racism within that department. So our country isn't perfect. It is the best country in the world, but it's not perfect. And it's okay to challenge that. You know, you should want to improve and fix the changes so that, you know, this country is equal and fair for everyone. And great points, and shout out to your dad for his service, Tori. It's uh, Mike, when it comes down to, and Steve, when it comes down to galvanizing the country, because what do we see in protesting now? It's just, it's just not African Americans, it's people of all ethnicities, because the George Floyd uh, tragedy was literally seen with all at home, uh, consuming lots of content. The dignity of a human being was totally dismissed. That's when it began to galvanize. And then now when we, we talk about uh, Kaepernick, one of the things going forward in order to cause change, once the protests are over, once the passion uh, and the media turns their attention away from it, it's now the policies and it's now the things that we put in place that will cause people that exhibit bad behavior, whether it's the community or the law enforcement, that we're now holding them accountable. When it comes down to the messaging, one of the things I want to continue to say, there's a lot of things we would like to see change, but as people of color, what are some of the number one, the top three things that we would like to see and continue every time we get in, for, in front of political leaders? Every time is not just go vote. It's not just register to vote. It's having a commonality among people of color. What are the issues we would like to see elected officials address, not with promises, but a, a drawn out plan before the election that determines where people of color vote? When it comes down to now messaging, because the flag and all of those things got convoluted, I would, I would now say Every person that decides, if they decide to kneel down, every time a mic is put in our faces, let's all begin to say, I am protesting to bring attention to the disproportionate abuse that we're seeing in people of color, underserved communities, where interaction with law enforcement. That way it's like branding. Athletes know about branding. That brand is... We need to see changes in all of the majority of our law enforcement are outstanding. So let's say that. But the ones that are not, the brand says our protest is to bring awareness to cause changes where we're no longer seeing the abuse of power among certain parts of law enforcement. The NFL has often sent mixed messages. Hey, we're going to give you money and then they keep it moving. Okay, football probably, we're expecting it to start on time. What can the league, and more specifically, individual clubs do to prove that they are authentic and sincere about making the change that they say they're going to make and kind of the boilerplate statements that they've released? Well, that's a great thing. Tori already mentioned it. I'm actually on the league committee with the Players Coalition, and the work that's already being done, the 90 uh, over $90 million that was earmarked over 10 years with player causes. Uh, so work is being done. It goes back to what Tory said. There's not a whole lot of fanfare. And then we've recently seen that the league has earmarked uh, another amount of money. But the most important thing that the league has done, they've apologized. There are a lot of corporations that are recognizing that, man, we need to get involved more with people of color and, and, and put our money toward it.
But how many have actually apologized? How many have said we got it wrong? Because as a Christ follower, reconciliation begins where somebody has to admit they're wrong. And then once you admit you're wrong, now during the season, giving these players even more of the platform, working together to build programs, work with organizations through the Players Coalition, working together. Because just as Tory is in the Baltimore area, all the players are all over the country, and particularly in NFL cities where there are a number of impoverished, impoverished, underserved communities of people of color that many of us have come out of. We now can use this influence not to just get a camera, as, as Tory said, but literally to go in what I call again the key of being a current NFL player, the key of being an NFL legend, the key of having a gold jacket. But going there, here it is. The goal is to, if God gives us the ability to be at the table, our responsibility is to represent the voice of people who are not at the table. When I go back and I study kingdoms, kings derive their greatest glory when they treated the least in their community the best. That's when they were admired the most because everybody treats all the great citizens well. It's how kings, it's how countries treat the least. That seems to what gets the attention of even heaven. Now, for me, I've been fortunate to be around Mr. Goodell and watch the way he's tried to learn. Um, speak with Troy Vincent, who's like a big brother to me, and, and understand what he's trying to do to help create change within his country. And I've also played for Jed York out there in San Francisco to know and literally watch how we handle Colin Kaepernick's situation and trying to do more to help the community. So I've been able to see some of the positive efforts and, like, they're helping to lead that charge. But at the same time, when you when you see apologies and you're like, okay, maybe too little too, little too late, but to me, I try to take the most of it, right? Like, Someone's willing to apologize. Corporate America doesn't apologize for anything. America doesn't apologize for anything. So I think it says a lot. But to me, there's going to always be, like, a stain because of Colin Kaepernick. I mean, now everyone's okay with kneeling, but that's literally the reason why Cap isn't in the NFL. So that's the one thing that I personally would love to see. I would love to see him get an honest and fair shot to go play. Is he going to be a, an amazing player again? I have no clue, but I know he deserves the opportunity. And if there's any time for it, it's now. Because it is, people are comfortable with it. I feel like people owe him a personal apology, you know? But that's something that we're all working towards. And again, it's a journey to try to understand what's going on around us. It's not an overnight thing. You don't wake up and just get it. And it's a process. And I hope that bringing him along is a part of that process. Tori, that, that's a great jumping out point for us to button this up. You were a teammate of Colin Kaepernick when he decided not to stand for the national anthem. Now, all of a sudden, there's a wave of players announcing well ahead of time and, and some coaches, hey, I'm going to go ahead and kneel to show support. What about that change? Because Cap didn't announce what he was going to do. This was, his personal, this was his personal protest. He said when he told me, I don't need anybody. I'm not going to ask anybody to do this. But now people are proclaiming this months ahead of time before the football season. What about the shift in thinking? Why do you think that is, Tori? And, and what about the fact that people are, are saying they're going to go ahead and do this now? You know, to me, I think some people just realize that what's going on is wrong, especially when a lot of, especially for like, I saw Baker Mayfield comes to mind to me. You know, when you're in a locker room with a lot of African-American men, and they're telling you about these issues, and now it comes to the front to the front like this, you can't hide it. And so support isn't just saying, hey, you're my brother. Like, no, I need to know you're there. And it's a huge step. And it's crazy how times changed and grown from it was literally Cap. I, was, I remember watching the whole entire process. He was literally sitting down on his tail. People forget that. He was sitting down, minding his business. And he talked with Nate Boyer, and Nate talked to him in the kneeling, out of respect for the military to make sure that his message couldn't be twisted. And it happened anyway. So I don't think he gets enough credit for adjusting because he didn't even have to do that. But, you know, to see people jumping on board now um, to support, I think it means a lot. But also, you know, if people don't want to kneel, if they want to do work as well, to me it's the same thing because uh, kneeling is a form of protest. It's a form of solidarity in a way uh, to show support. 
But to me, your gestures don't mean as much as your actions. You could take a knee all you want, but are you going to go and create the change that we want to see? And, Tori, great point. And, and going back to me working with Mr. York, working with Troy, working with Tracy Perlman, being with Roger, being with some of the owners, and knowing that people care. Steve, you mentioned Ferguson. The biggest landowner in Ferguson is the Emerson Corporation. When all of that happened, I met with the CEO, uh, Dave Farr. Dave Farr, a Caucasian gentleman, he literally had the maps of the underserved communities in Ferguson. He said, we've put $360 million over the past 10 years in the, in the municipality of Ferguson. He says, but we have to revamp because these type of things are happening. We need to now look at where we put the money and where we need to put the money going forward. So guess what they did? They began to uh, put money toward uh, anybody that was in the community that were putting, that were starting to establish, uh, what do they call it, uh, child care, not child care, uh, early childhood education. That's what it was. Right. Because after they did all of their research, after they had a company go in and assess what are the true needs Early childhood education, our Caucasian young men by the age of five were speaking hundreds of more words than their fellow counterpart among people of color. So guess what they did? They targeted that particular area and began to help fund start up African Americans, helping them with best practices to do what? To solve problems. So when it goes down to the kneeling, what I would love to see Yes, we still bring attention to it, but every time a camera interview, why did you kneel? Not only to bring awareness, but maybe share something like Tory. If Tory was playing and he was kneeling, I would say, hey, Tory, when they interview you, share with them what you're doing in the community or a shout out to an organization that's helping solve these problems. And then now watch these owners, watch this league now begin like they're doing with Big Brothers and Big Sisters, the money that's going toward that, Anquan Bolden, the Kill Spikes and all of those guys, and targeting money towards smaller organizations that no one knows about. And maybe st instead of giving them the money, down in Florida, Anquan was talking about voter rights and making sure there was an organization that very few people knew. So what the league said, we would love to, to uh, earmark money toward it. Why don't we do this, Anquan? Why don't we connect the smaller organization with the bigger one to establish, help them establish good practices so they can now fund the money and it be used properly to really help the, the cause. And this work is so important and it's so hard and there's so many facets to it. And Aeneas just brought up some great ones and, and Tori has talked about them and it's, that's the most important thing. But, Symbolism is important, too, and, and I agree with Tori. We can't give Colin Kaepernick back his rightful career and those few years, but him being signed to an NFL team would go a long, long way symbolically and, and giving him an opportunity that he clearly deserves. I mean, if, if people are out there trying to make the case that he's not one of the best 64 quarterbacks on earth, based on his body of work, it's ridiculous. We know exactly why he has not been employed the last few years, and it just takes one uh, owner and organization to step up and say, we're doing this. And you know what? And I don't want to compare this in terms of context or deed, but Michael Vick came back from a conviction uh, and time served, uh, and people thought if that guy ever got in a team again, it would be insane there'd be protests and boycotts and it would be terrible and he went to the eagles it was a hot story for a couple of days he put his head down and ended up being evaluated as a player and as a, a man who really grew uh, colin kaepernick committed no crime but if you're worried about the mm -hmm. circus or the distraction element you know what just suck it up do the right thing history will remember you well you can't right the wrong, but you can at least give us that symbolism and, and sign the man, put up with a couple of days of, of hysteria, and let's try to move forward. We have all heard the default 
deflection when we're talking about seeing changes in law enforcement, voting availability, whatever, when it comes to people of color, the deflection of, well, what about black on black crime? What about mm -hmm. Chicago? But let's not treat this as a deflection. Let's have a conversation here. And Tori, I want to start with you about black on black crime. If, if you can explain why some of us see it as a deflection, others of it see it as a huge problem, I don't think anybody, you know, sees a middle ground here, which is, which is peculiar. But if you could explain the black on black crime issue, and let's well, have this me, conversation. Yeah, you know, when you talk about black on black crime, black people tend to live around black people. So black crime is going to exist. We don't say white on white crime. White people tend to live around white people, but there's crime there. Obviously, there tends to be a tie between crime and poverty, which is why the rough neighborhoods that people are forced to live mm -hmm. in, like, crime tends to exist. You know, there aren't resources, there aren't opportunity. And honestly, understanding history and redlining and how some of these neighborhoods were literally built that way and still seeing a, a country and a community that's still recovering from our first opioid epidemic, which was the crack era, and the criminal justice reform, the laws and things that were put into place from that, which we are now trying to reform, and the families who are recovering from that trauma, that abuse, that is still ongoing as we speak, it's a tough challenge. You know, I like to tell people, if I have a broken hand and a broken leg, like, they're both problems. You know, it's not the exact same thing, but they both have to be treated. So to me, yes, crime in impoverished neighborhoods in the black community is an issue in terms of murders and things like that, but also schooling is an issue. You know, also police brutality is an issue. All of these things, like, they're not tied together. They're all individual problems that are all part of a systemic issue. Great point, Tori. And, and Steve, hopefully I can get through this without crying because I grew up with mom and dad down in New Orleans, grew up in Holly Grove, the same area where Lil Wayne from, went to school with baby, Birdman. We went to school together. My dad's the first college graduate on both sides of the family. Well, we have to understand okay. it's two separate pillars. The first one is to bring attention to people who are supposed to abide by the law and treat even those that are having bad days, I'm talking about people that may have done something wrong. They still are United States citizens. They still are people made in God's image. So they still should carry value, even though they're having a bad day. As it relates to the community issue, which is separate, it certainly needs to be addressed and no one is not ignoring it. It's now coming up with, a, with an answer and a solution to understand Let's also train our law enforcement who are serving in these communities to understand when you pull someone over that are in a lot of these communities where we're hurting and killing each other, when you're treated in the environment as such, you lose dignity for yourself and you don't think that your fellow other African-American has dignity either. So the value of life decreases because the community is treated as if they don't matter. And then throw on top of it, instead of community policing, meaning some of the things was instituted in Ferguson, was that there would be a certain part of the police uh, district where the officers were from the community. Why? Because when you're a part of the community, you understand the challenges and the systemic issues that the community is dealing with. So when you see a young African, young man who gets pulled over, gets yelled at, shows some resistance, even in his voice, you'll understand is not that this person is a bad person. They've grown up in environments where this is how they react to any type of challenge from authority, particularly if authority is not communicating to them in a way that's respectful, even if they're doing things wrong. So, the separate issue, Steve, make sure I'm clear. Let's deal with law enforcement community to bring dignity back, to say that every American citizen, no matter if they're having a bad day, because guess what? If a cop has a bad day, does something unlawful, he still goes through a process where he's still treated with somewhat with dignity. Let's do the same thing and remind our officers through training, through community practices, things that, that we can do to get them together with community and show them examples of what's going on in these communities 
and what are the best ways to now solve crime where we can end up not having to have fatal, fatal interactions with people who've committed sometime misdemeanor or traffic violations. I also think it's important to go backwards a little bit. Like, when you talk about crime in neighborhoods, people tend to act like things aren't happening and people aren't fighting for it. I can tell you specifically, in Baltimore, every Monday night since I retired, I walked the streets with hundreds of men, hundreds of black men, and there were people from all over coming together to try to give resources to the people on the corner, to give resources to the homeless men, whether that was jobs, shelter, or whatever it may be. There just aren't cameras there. So people right. do care about it. it. It is important. You know, it's just not on the front line as often as, as something like this, which is polarizing and people want to talk about it. There are people in grassroots organizations that are fighting for safety and trauma and whatever kind of support they can get in these neighborhoods on daily in this country. People like Tori and Adias who actually go out and do this work, I want to hear from them about these issues. I, I'm going to try to say this charitably. It, it is a privilege at best to be able to throw out, well, what about black on black crime? First of all, 99% of the time it's not sincere, it's ill intentioned, and it's meant to deflect. And, you know, as Tori said, there are systemic reasons why poverty and uh, if you go back to redlining, you know, what, why certain neighborhoods have ended up in these conditions and, and it's been enforced, uh, in, in a sense. And what Ania said is absolutely right. These people, uh, you know, all people need to be treated with dignity. And when you have a society where law, some law enforcement officers and, and some people are programmed to believe that people of one color are somehow nefarious and engaged in criminal enterprise because of idiotic blanket statements like what about black on black crime in Chicago uh, made at the highest levels uh, of our government right now uh, and you have them pre-programmed to believe that people with my skin color are victims or uh, you know neutral at at worst uh, it's the whole system is flawed and you absolutely do need to have uh, law enforcement officers who are in touch with their community and ideally, as Aeneas said, who are members of that community. Well, I want to button up this thought as well. If anybody thinks that black people, brown people, anybody is okay with murdering another person, they're wrong. Those people are often brought to justice in black and brown communities, which is why our prisons are filled with black and brown people. What people are protesting now is that bad police officers are held just as accountable for their wrongful behavior as those people in those neighborhoods who are doing wrong things. Aeneas, mm -hmm. you being in Ferguson, you were there from the beginning. You and your wife established your church in Ferguson before Michael Brown was shot by a police officer. During that situation, you and your, your congregation and people you work with were voices of comfort and support and have since established a lot of programs in that community. What exactly have you done and what are some of the benefits that you are seeing there? First, Steve, shout out to a gentleman by the name of Pastor Jose who's on the ground and he has an organization called Adopt the Block. Our church partnered with Adopt the Block, and what we began to do was go door to door to knock on the doors and find out what do people need? What do they want? Now, we may say, man, look how they're living. Of course we know what they want. But it's a difference between helping people as partners versus I'm coming to give you a handout. Anytime we have to understand slavery was promulgated, it was superior, Caucasian people were uh, supposed to be superior, and African Americans inferior. And in parts of the church, it was communicated that way. So because you first got to deal with that, even when we go to help people in underserved communities, when we go and we go and we're handing things out, 
guess what we're communicating without saying it? The superior is coming to help feed the inferior. Versus, Steve, what do we need in the community? We knocked on a door and it was a young man that had a family, his wife and about three children there. He said, I need help. I've been to jail. I admit the wrong that I made. I've served my time, but I can't get a viable job for my family because of the felony. Is there anything that could be done to help us be gainfully employed now that we've served our time and we want to take care of our family? So it was efforts and things that we did like that to help young men to now not be uh, unemployable because they had a felony. So it was first, Steve, finding out what were the needs and then partnering with the community together to solve the need. Tori, that's a good jumping off point because with your nonprofit and you being a member of the Players Coalition, I mean, a lot of people, are, including yourself especially, have been at the forefront of trying to make change. With what this momentum you talked about following the tragedies with George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor, what can, you, what can we do to advance this even further? I mean, do we, do we cast a wide net and try to find solutions in a lot of different places? Do things have to be streamlined? And what are some of the things you and your nonprofit are doing to actually make that difference? You know, with the Players Coalition, we've been focusing on bringing awareness to issues, but not only that, we've actually helped policies, helping to go lobby for policy that creates change. Uh, I think people underestimate the power of their vote and policy because literally African Americans are free in this country because of policy. You're able to vote because of, you know, a policy. And these are things like we aren't really educated, and a lot of people aren't educated about the civic process. So that's something that we use our platform and our popularity to help educate others. But personally, myself, I've learned, just like Mr. Anise, is that being on the ground is where you can create the most change. You know, I'm in the process right now of partnering with Baltimore Rec and Park to run our programs through one of their community centers. Well, what does that mean for me? Obviously, I just retired, but I can be present. My wife is a former teacher. She can be present. We can bring the resources in. We can bring people from the city, from different backgrounds, bring them into this neighborhood because the area that we will be is in a neighborhood. You aren't bringing the kids from the neighborhood into the nicer part of the city. You're going to them. And beyond that, which really everything in has said hit home, is that you're, you're allowing them to tell you what they need. Oftentimes, people come in and you're like, oh, you need this, so we're going to provide this. No. What do you need? We're going to provide it and help. We're going to work together to be the village to help change this area in the city one neighborhood at a time. So my approach is always policy and educating others. But if I can help one individual, individually or with my family or with my fund, that's all a part of the process. And my job is no important than the grassroots organization, leader, or even the lowest person in their organization. We all have a part to play in helping to create a better America. Yeah, I think this is an incredible time. As, as hard as it is on many levels and, and what we're going through societally, uh, this did not just happen overnight. Aeneas has been doing this for a long, long time. Tori and many, many players of this era have been laying this important groundwork. And, and now people are noticing more. But um, I, I, that's, that's the kind of systemic, sustained uh, change that we're going to have to make to, to truly advance as a society. And, uh, you know, I know we've tried to draw attention to that these past few years as others have tried to change the, the subject and, and deflect the original message of the kneeling. But um, I, I just, as a media member, I just want to challenge myself and others to, to not, you know, or to keep our eye on the ball because this, this great work is going on. And, and I appreciate that Tory doesn't want cameras in tow and he doesn't want a grandstand when he does this stuff. But um, I, I just think we need to to let people know what's really going on on the ground. 